victory that was challenged by all these kings. They said, oh, they, they can only defeat us on the mountain. Let's go down to the valley. And the Israelites conquered there too because God is the God of valleys and the God of mountains. And a lot of times in our negative world, we talk about it's a bad thing to be in a valley. Do you know how God's going to reach people in the valley? By us being in the valley. So it's all about your, your perspective, how you're perceiving things. Sometimes going through the valley, we learn the most, right? And sometimes going through the valley, we make lifelong friends. And sometimes going through the valley, we rescue the lost and open up the eyes of the blind. And the valley ends up being the most promising part of our life. When things seem grim, when same, same, things seem dark, it's when the light comes in as the brightest. It ends up being a great marker on your life. I'll ask for free. It wasn't part of what I'm preaching. Okay? Let's pray. Hallelujah. Father, we just give you thanks for this awesome time. This awesome time together where, you're, where you are showing your victorious reign here on this earth. Where you're going to get all the glory. Where glory is going to become brighter and brighter. To where light is going to overtake the darkness. To where darkness is going to fall on their knees and, and cry out for the light. And Lord, we get to be your ambassadors. We get to be the carriers of your glory. We surrender ourselves as your vessels, your vessels of glory. Yes, Lord, we just thank you. Yes, Lord, you are good. So good. All the time, you're good. We praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. I got so many scriptures running through my head, I really don't want to preach what I put on there. But the message I'm preaching today is really what you might say is a basic message. It's been preached over and over again. But I'm telling you, the time that we live in, it's very important. Because it says, be strong in the Lord. And you want to be strong in the Lord before you go into battle. You want to have the full armor of God on you before you go into the battle. And it says, you know, in our country, we're not used to this, but it says in, in uh, 2 Timothy three twelve, it says, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Here in the States, we're not seeing that yet. We can live as a Christian and not be bothered. Not in my generation. Hadn't happened. They might say names against you at the most. And I'm not saying it's coming. But I am saying this. I gladly welcome it. I hope we get some. And you're saying why? Because his glory spreads more in the midst of persecution. Now do I personally want to suffer? I might not feel like it. But if I know it's for his glory. You see, because we have to understand. We need to understand. I've already died. As Jesus told Mary in John 11. If you, if you believed in me. You've crossed over from death to life. Do you know that when you believed in Jesus, you actually gave up death? Do you know that you were a dead man walking? You didn't have no life to give to Jesus? He says, oh, brother, just come down here and give your life to Jesus. You didn't have no life to give. Apart from him, there is no life. You didn't have no life to give. And anything apart from him is not life. You enjoying your life? God wants us to enjoy His life. It's an exchanged life, you know that? He exchanged life for your death. He gave you life where you didn't have life, and He gave you life. It's an exchanged life, because it ain't your life. You've been bought with a price, and you are no longer your own. I'll get into that in a minute. But glory be to God, because He is the hope of all creation. Apart from Him, 
there's no hope. Confident expectation of good. But in him, there's the fullness of hope. May the God of peace fill you with all joy. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you might overflow with hope in believing. That's what he wants. By believing in him, you'll overflow with hope. And that hope is a, not wish someday wishing over a rainbow. That hope is a confident expectation of good. Why? Because he's good. Why? Because you're in union with him. Therefore, you can have hope, a confident expectation of goodness. But I'm telling you, in the times we live in, you need to realize that one died for all, therefore all died. And we who have died agree that it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In this life I live in the body, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. And I live as an ambassador of God telling, that God, telling the world that God reconciled the world to himself through Jesus Christ on the cross. Open your eye and come into the life. Come into light. Have life. Am I too loud? I'm excited. If I'm too loud, open the doors. I, I, don't, I don't know. But I, I, I quote this scripture a lot, but we need to, I'm telling you, this, this, this lifetime of going about not having the right perspective is going to ruin you. If you think this life is about you, you've lost the right perspective. God says this life is about you in union with him. Oneness with Him. Apart from Him, there is no life. Apart from Him, you cannot receive and experience the fullness of life. I came that you might have life and have it abundantly does not mean I came that you might have life, live over here in your independent self, have the big house, have the big car, have what you want, and call that life. Apart from Him, there is no life. I came that you might have the fullness of life, and that life is only going to be found in that union with Him. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Remember, we stand up here with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit holding hands, and you dip in, and you're in the circle. That's life. Apart from that, step out of that, you're not going to find that life. Too loud? Habakkuk 2.14, the time is coming, and I feel it's now, when the earth shall be filled with the intimacy, knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. God is expecting his fullness of glory manifesting through you. You're that vessel of glory. Yes, you are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you know that you're that vessel of glory? Do you know it's not about anything apart from him? There's no glory in it. It says, God will not share his glory with another. How many of you heard that? You're not another. You're not another. You're in him. You're oneness in him. So don't say God won't share his glory with you because you're in him. His glory is flowing through you. All who will come to me, I will, I will share the glory of living waters flowing through me. God will share his glory with you because you're not another. You're not another. You're a one. Many don't want to take responsibility for this. I'm telling you, the times of living in America and go to church once a week, time of living in America and going to church once a week and saying that's sharing the glory of God, and compartmentalizing your life to where I go to church on Sunday uh, and then I go to work Monday through Saturday and I'm barely, barely getting by until I get back to sun, Sunday. Man, I hope we can have a Wednesday night Bible study. I ain't going to make it. You need to take a responsibility for your life. And the life he's given you is you're a glory vessel. What's taking responsibility mean? Are you telling me that works, works, works? No, we're going to get to that. What I'm telling you is, if you, if you have faith in Him, that faith will manifest. And if you have faith in Him and understand your purpose and His perspective, it will manifest in the life of other people. You know the reason the world is, this country is in the shape it's in? Because we're not manifesting that glory. We've got to take responsibility. 
And the only way we take responsibility is understanding our purpose. I, I'm, I'm way ahead of myself, but that's okay. Because we want to get to it. Christianity in this country has become so self-centered. So self-centered. It's false Christianity. You know, we're bred from the time we grow up. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Do things on your own. You know, get the right job, get the right house, get the right car, get the right woman, the right man. Then we move into suburbia, United States. We have our clicker on our garage door. We go into our own kingdom. We watch four hours of the stupid box. We go to bed and we get up and do it the next day. Idiot box. And we're rulers of our own kingdom. And that's the good life. That's the, that's the American dream. And then we throw something in there. If you work hard for 20 years, 25, 30 years, they keep expanding it. Then you can retire and experience the good life in your own little kingdom. And you can travel around and get your vacations, but I want to be on a private island. We got the wrong perspective. Jesus didn't come just to give you some self-serve Christianity. It ain't no Burger King. You can be your own king at Burger King and drive through and say, Jesus, I want some of this. I want some of that. I take some. But I don't want none of that. I don't like them people. I don't want to be around people. If you want to reach people, you can do it some other way. But I'll pray. I'll go in my prayer closet and I'll pray. If my favorite show's not on. You know, uh, there is actually a scripture in Luke 9, 23. It says, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. And it says, daily. And it's amazing. That one word there has been disputed over the centuries. Because, see, none of the other gospels have that word daily. There's been books, doc doctrinal dissertations written on why that, that word daily is not really in some of the manuscripts. But I'm telling you, before your feet hit the ground in the morning, you better say, Lord, I want to surrender you to, again to this day and let it be your life living through me, not some stupid idea that my brain, my flesh wants to say what this life looks like. It's a daily reminder that apart from him, you have no life. Apart from a surrendered, humble life to him, your plans are not his plans. Man can have plans, but the Lord directs the steps. You want his highways to be your highways? Then surrender to him and say, Lord, it's all about you. And you know what? You'll go out with a burden lifted off of you. You know, even in Christianity, as a pastor, I used to sit around and plan my ministry time. I didn't have a calendar. I have, I have 50 notes everywhere. Where's your calendar at? There, 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 there. Well, how do you keep up? I know where they are. But my plan was to do ministry here, do ministry here, do ministry here. And then when it didn't happen, because I made that plan with my brain and, and I thought through prayer, but when it didn't happen, what did I do? I get frustrated. I get upset. God says, recognize who you are. Know your identity in Christ. Know your identity in oneness with me that you've been baptized into Christ and you've been raised into newness of life, the resurrected life, and that you die no more, and you're going to be my glory as you go out today. It takes the burden off, and it, and it helps you stay focused on this daily walk as a daily glory vessel looking to shine light in the midst of darkness. It says in this world, it's a midst, midst of a crook. Paul wrote this way back. He says, you're a light in the midst of a crooked and perverted generation. Way back then, was he a prophet? It was going on then. And he wrote that in captivity, in prison, in jail. In jail, in a dungeon. And the book's titled, The Book of Joy. How can you have joy? Because the God he has has no bounds. He can actually say, hey, 
Don't worry about me. Rejoice. Rejoice about me. You know why you need to rejoice? Because of this, in the valley, in the dungeon, I'm getting to share the gospel with the whole praetorian guard. Where else would I be in such close, close contact with the emperor's guards? If I didn't come in here, if God didn't allow me to be here, this whole guard wouldn't come to know Jesus. He didn't write the letter I would have wrote, or might have wrote. Oh, please pray that the Lord gets me out of here. Lord, how could you do this to me? What happened? Why? Hey, if you've got to leave, I understand. I'm telling you, self-centered Christianity doesn't work. It's time to get rid of that. And it's time to quit walking as we've been walking. Because this is how our education system raises us. We walk by sight. We figure it out by reason and logic. And we walk it out that way. We even do that in our own religious whatever. Saying, well, I know what God wants me to do. And I'm going, boom, 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 boom. And I'm going to figure it out. And this is where I'm going. And we miss out on being led by the Spirit. We're led by reason and logic just like the world. Then it just becomes a colored walk that doesn't give off the glory that God wants to give off because we didn't trust in the Spirit to lead us. Because when we drove through the drive through to get some, get some guidance from the Holy Spirit, and He said, wait, we said, no, I ain't waiting. I'll go next door and get me a burger. We're so impatient. And we place such little value on prayer and fasting and waiting and hearing from the Spirit. And we've been so impatient that we say, well, I did it for a day and it didn't work, so I'm going to just go over here and do this. And if God doesn't want me to do that, he'll put up a roadblock. Well, he might, true. But we've got to get back to just trusting him. You see, this whole, this whole Christian walk is that you're a spirit person. You're a spirit man and woman. You're a spirit son and daughter. And you're to be led by the Spirit. But so often, even as Christians, we're led by our mind, thoughts, feelings, and emotions. We're soul-led Christians. And in those mind, thoughts, feelings, and emotions, it's, well, you know, I just don't feel like God's hearing my prayers. Quit your whining. It says He hears your prayers. He's your Father. Well... I just don't think he wants me to go over here. I, it doesn't feel comfortable. Is it about you or him? Is he with you or not? Is he the God of the valley and the God of the mountains? Is he the God of the one next door? Well, I'm not talking to them. I just don't like them. Oh, well, enough of that. But So what is faith and how is it to be lived out? I know this is a basic message. I know you've heard it a hundred times. And I usually preach on John 17 on the first Sunday of January because I love that. I did it last year. But I think this is very pertinent for where we're at now. And so I want us to look, really, what is faith? And how is it lived out? Because you aren't your own. You've been bought with a price. So what does that look like in your life? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by? How's your hearing going? Because you know what that word hearing means? It comes from the Greek word okuo. But okuo actually means to listen at the expense of all other voices. It means you're so tuned in that you're not distracted by the other voices you're hearing. And faith comes by hearing, hearing word of Christ or the word of God. Some translations say Christ, some say God. You know what? They're the same. So I'm not going to split hairs. But hearing and seeking him and hearing him is a lot different than hearing him and several other voices. <clears throat> Hearing at the expense of all else. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Nothing came into being except it came into being by Him. It actually says in, 
Y'all need to read John 1, 1 through 14 all the time. You know, because it says as many as received him. It, it actually says in that, in that passage of scripture that he came to his own people. And his own people didn't recognize him. What were they hearing? CNN? How the stomach turns? This is my life. They didn't recognize him. There's a book written not too long ago about Jesus, if Jesus came in blue jeans. Anybody read that book? I know it was a bestseller. <laughs> I picked it up at a laundromat. So I know it was a bestseller. But it was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was fun because Jesus came to America and he wore blue jeans and, and, uh, and everything else and nobody recognized him. And you're like, well, I know if Jesus came today, I'd recognize him. Would you? You know the only way you're going to recognize him is through your spirit? Spirit man's going to be the one that recognizes him. Not your five senses. But in that John 1 passage in verse 12, it says, to as many as received him. What does that mean? Lombano, what does that mean? To as many as take hold of him and make it your own possession. Lombano. To as many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God. How are you, how's your receiving? The word became flesh. Faith is a gift. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves is the gift of God. Do you realize that each of you have been given as believers the measure of faith? You've been given the very faith of the Son of God. I love this 121 in James. I hope you all love the word as much as I do. Because if you don't, you know what? You're going to get bored listening to me. Sorry, just being honest. James 1.21 talks about faith. God's word and faith has been implanted in you. And it's that God birth persuasion that's been implanted in you. So what I'm talking about today is when we're talking about faith, this is not something you've got to go and seek if you're a believer. It's been implanted in you. If you're not knowing it, it's because you're not watering what's been implanted in you. If you're watering it and you're hearing his voice at the expense of all others, if you're hearing that voice, then you're going to know that faith implanted in you because it's going to rise up and grow. And it's going to flourish. I want to read it in the Passion. James 1.21, and it's the middle of a sentence, but that's okay. You can go look at it. Instead, with a sensitive spirit, we absorb God's word, which has been implanted within our nature. Right? Because Peter, 2 Peter tells us we're now participants and partakers of the divine nature. As a believer, you... You, the old man is gone, the new has come, and now you're implanted into a new nature, the divine nature. For the word of life has power to continually deliver us. Faith is his faith, which is now your faith. I got 20 more slides and we'll be done. Now, disclaimer. Most, not all Christians. Okay? Everybody get that? Most, not all. All, got that? I'm not standing up here pointing fingers at you or myself, either one. I'm just making observations. Too many people today are offended over anything that disagrees with them. You know, had a, had a Louisiana pastor that I used to listen to. And I loved, it took a while. It was like me, it was worse than me first starting to listen to Joseph Prince. Anybody listen to Joseph Prince? First few times it took you a while to get his accent? You should listen to this guy. He's full Cajun. I had a Cajun roommate in the Marine Corps, and we were partners as military policemen. And daggone, if I didn't call him on the radio and would say, 
Would you speak English? Of course, he, I was from Tennessee, so he didn't think I was speaking English. So I said, yours ain't English either. I said, we got, we got to get some Morse code going or something. But what was I talking about? His name was, oh, being offended, that's right, that's right. So this pastor, this full-blown Cajun pastor in Louisiana, Valerie and I used to listen to. Somebody in Alabama turned us on to him. Anyway, uh, he said, before my feet hit the ground in the morning, I say, Lord, I just want to take this opportunity to for forgive all those people that are going to do me wrong today. I want to take this opportunity to say thank you, Lord, that even in any trials I go through with people treating me bad, treating me wrong, or taking over what I claim to be my rights, that I can surrender to them right, surrender to these to you right now, and say I forgive just as Jesus forgave me. Now you might think that's funny, but try it sometimes, because when you do, it gives you that expectation of opportunity to forgive. Make sense? Why is the glory of Jesus? In us, not flowing through us like a river from our innermost being. You know, he said from your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Sometimes we got a little spigot drip. Sometimes we got a we got a, a stony brook that's been decimated and dry. And yet all the time that that well is inside us. It ain't prime though. It ain't flowing. How come? I shouldn't even give you all these notes. But I hope you take them that way. I should print them out sometimes. And me and Jared and my wife were listening to Rodney Howard Brown this week, and so some of this is from him. I think I added a part or two. But it was very good. Why? Because most Christians in America, they get three hot meals a day for the body, plus snacks, Right? Their soul has four hours a day of television and other secular media. Some buffet the soul all day long. Even when they're feeding the body, they're sitting in front of the idiot box watching something that's not good, that's not helping them. Hey, I got a dad that's going to sit down at 6 o'clock, and he's going to have his food, and he's going to watch the news. And it ain't changed in 80 years. Well, he probably didn't have TV then. But it hadn't changed since I've known him. He's going to watch the evening news. So he's buffeting the body and buffeting the soul. Some people don't have silence all day long. They're buffeting the soul with something all day long that's not of the Lord. And then the spirit, which is the real you, you know, the spirit is supposed to be the guardian and the leader of the soul and the body. But we have it so opposite. Sometimes it's the body leading people the most. If I let my body lead me, you'd be having to push me through this door because I love to eat. Mm, I could buffet that body all day long. I'm telling you. Eat me a rack of ribs. Oh, you got cheeseburger over there with bacon? Let me have some of that. Oh, well, we got to have a little dessert and some chocolate ice cream now. Put some chocolate chips on there. Two hours later, we're driving by. You know, they make good milkshakes. Let's pull in here and get a milkshake. Oh, well, let's get some fries, too. They got them, them cheese and cheddar and cheddar fries with bacon on them and jalapenos. Let's get some of them and a shake. I can do it now. But the spirit is supposed to be leading. That's the, reason, that's the reason we do prayer and fast and so the spirit man leads, right? Hey, can you turn, while you're up, can you turn that clock back a few minutes? So anyway, no, don't speed it up, man. So anyway, we get three hot meals a day for our body and snacks. I like my snacks. And our soul, we buffet all day long. And then the spirit man, now like I said, I got to go back to the disclaimer. If this doesn't fit you, then don't be offended. Okay? But a lot of times, the spirit, which is the real you in union with Christ, because there is no life apart from him, 
snacks only. Or you fast some days in the Spirit. Or you get one cold snack a week. Now if you look at that, why would it surprise you that the glory of God's not being manifested more strongly through the body of believers? Because we're all one body. And we're all supposed to be running at maximum efficiency so that the body accomplishes all that God sent us out to do. And God's word, he says, I don't send it out and it comes back empty and void without accomplishing the purposes for which I sent it. Right? But right now, he sent that word through us. Is it accomplishing everything he sent it out to do? He wants us to not be snacking on the body and buffeting the soul. He wants us to be feasting on the spirit. He wants us to be feasting. How many of you, how many of you fasted for over three days? Now, I, this is not a judgment thing. In fact, don't raise your hand. Because I don't want people looking around. Whoa. But you know it takes two or three days before you get to where you forget about food. It shows you how much your body can be in control of you. But you get past them three days. And especially me and my wife used to do this. Uh, I'd take one of my vacations when I was a full-time pastor, and, and we'd go up in the mountains separately. And we had two kids at the time, so we'd split it, and we'd fight over who got the extra day. She'd take three days, and I'd fight for four. But you get up there, and after the first two days you fast, and you get that hunger out of you, and we'd consciously get a place that had no TV and you sit there and open your word and sit there praising God and with a notepad and you'd fill notepad after notepad of stuff he's sharing with you. And you know what? You are more hungry for more. God, you got to give me more, God. God, give me more. You're sitting there feasting and you got a pile of it in front of you that you're written out and you're saying, Lord, more. More, Lord. Taste and see that it is good. Because the one who tastes will be more hungry. You know, it's the opposite of the body. Well, I shouldn't, I just told you how I buffet my body. But for most people, you eat until you're full. But the more you eat in your spirit, man, the more hungry you are. And he doesn't run out giving you stuff. He doesn't run out and say, oh, you've drained this well dry. I ain't got nothing else to give you. Giving you all. One cold snack a week for your spirit, man, is not going to leave him in charge. It's just not. Hope this message ain't too hard. What does Womack say? It's going down like a rat sandwich. Hope it ain't. Faith is a noun most of the time. You know, a lot of times I just got to have more faith. Faith is a noun most of the time you look in the Bible. The only reason I didn't put all the time is I didn't want to go through all of them to see. But I went through enough to know that most of the time faith is a noun. Faith has to have an object too. So who's your faith? Jesus. Say it with me, class. Jesus. Faith is a noun. So what is the verb for that faith? Belief. Believing is the action verb of the noun faith. That's the real meaning of faith without works. Because it says in James, you know, there was that argument, Martin Luther, I want to say Martin Luther King Jr. My gosh. You know that road we named after that dude. Uh, Martin Luther in the Reformation wanted to kick out the book of James because he didn't have the right perception. He was saying, he was thinking of how the Catholic Church had defined faith was how much are you doing what the book of James is saying if you have faith you'll naturally be doing because it's an automatic response to the faith in you your believing will be stepping out and helping people your believing will be as you go heal the sick cleanse the leopard cast out demons raise the dead as you go just like the disciples went as they went, they knew all authority in heaven and earth had been given to them. He says, as you go. That's what James is about. 
James is about as you go, we'll see what your faith looks like because we'll see the action of that belief. Same way with your tongue. I love James 3. You want a practical book of how's your faith look? How's your faith look? You know, a mirror for how's your faith look? Look at the book of James. It'll show you. If you're having problems taming your tongue, you're probably just feeding on that spirit one or two snacks a week. Because if you feed on that spirit man, that spirit man's leading you, it naturally falls away. And I'm speaking from experience. I was in the Marine Corps as a military policeman. And I'm telling you, in the Marine Corps as a military policeman, no excuse. I'm not giving you no excuse. I'm just saying I was reading the Bible every day. I was the only Marine I knew that was a Christian until my fourth year in the Marine Corps. But it was dry as toast because I was doing it out of rote, something I had to do. And so my language was terrible. People were coming at me, and I was arresting them all the time, and I was returning evil for evil. Evil for evil. And you know what? I had the cuffs. I had the badge. Now, I'm not saying I was doing, not arresting people I shouldn't be arresting. No, I'm just saying my mouth was spouting stuff it shouldn't, wasn't made for. It wasn't coming from the glory of God, right? But I say all that because when I got out and got married and started being in the Word of God, I didn't have to say, Oh, I need to quit cussing. I need to quit saying that word. I need to quit. I didn't have to. Because as we talk about identity all the time, it's right believing, receiving who you are in Christ, knowing your identity, resting in who God says you are. I am who he says I am. Then you'll naturally, you'll naturally rely on the Spirit and respond with belief and that stuff will fade away I know I'm way behind Let's see where I need to cut but faith believing is being persuaded by the Lord and it proceeds from that inbirthing of faith just like we said in John 1 12 everybody knows John 3 16 Jesus they came to Jesus in John 6 28 and says what must we do to do the works of God we see what you're doing, Jesus. What must I do to do those same works, Jesus? I want to do them. Believe. And it actually is, if you look at it, keep on believing. It's a present, active, imperative participle. It's a very complicated word in Greek, but it means keep on believing. And I give you this as a command. Keep believing. John 20, 29, he says to Thomas, Oh, because you have seen, you now believe? How blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. We've seen with our spirit eyes, which is more powerful than your naked physical eyes. Because your true eyes see in the spirit. Walk by faith, not by sight. And all the promises of God are yes and amen. Take the promises out. One a day, one a week. Take them out, write them down, and say, can this be true? It's God's word. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the word. There is no, nothing else but truth in it, and it will give you life. So believe. I see the kids coming out. I know I'm really going. Hey, that clock's wrong. It's really 1130, so we're good. Faith. Now listen up. I know the kids are coming in and everything, and that's great. But listen up. Faith will take its prominent role. Oh, y'all can't read that. I'm sorry. Faith will take its prominent role through regular exercise of believing. Okay? That's what it says. Faith will take its prominent role through regular exercise of you believing. Walking by faith, not by sight. His faith implanted is not his faith manifested. Do you understand that? He's implanted faith in you. His faith. But it's the fullness of that manifestation is not going to happen if you don't exercise and walk out and believe in. But if you walk out and believe in, more and more of that living stream of water is going to flow through you and give, give food for the thirsty, for those who are suffering, those who are dry. John 7, 3, 
737, you know, he came, he says, anybody is thirsty, come to me, and rivers of living water will flow from your innermost being. Learn from experience. That's some of our best learning. And a lot of times, like I said, it's down in the valley. But as you stay in faith, believing, faith become, becomes more prominent. You remember this? You remember all those stories? He talked about the mustard seed of faith. As it was watered and as it grew, as it was, as we would say in our life, as we were exercising what we believed, that faith and walking it out, it grows up and gives shade for all kinds of people. The same way with the yeast in the dough, right? He says, beware of the Pharisees' yeast, the yeast of religion. Beware of the yeast of the kingdom of Herod, which is the yeast of the world. Y'all hear that? Beware of that yeast of the world. If you're watching that mainstream media, that's the yeast of the world. But he says, the, the yeast of God's word will spread throughout. All right? And the same way he talked about the sower and the seed. The seed planted on good soil. The soul that's not just getting one snack a week. The spirit man that's feasting on the Lord. That's good soul. And that good soul is going to get a bountiful harvest. And what's the harvest? What's the harvest? What's the harvest? Look out unto the fields. They're white unto harvest. What's the harvest? People. Thank you. The harvest is the people. And the disciples, Jesus said, he actually said, I want you to be the answer to your own prayer. You remember that? Jesus said, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray, and then you're going to be the answer to your own prayer. And, and you can look it up in Matthew 9. Because he says, pray unto the Lord for laborers to send out into that harvest, that harvest that's white and ready to be picked. Pray unto the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. Who did he send out? The disciples. And they got to be the answer to their own prayer. Isn't that cool? I think it's cool. I like that. I like that. Lord, I pray that you let us be your laborers. Send us out into that harvest. It's white into harvest. You know, gosh, you know a lot of times people think the harvest ain't white. I'm telling you, in today's time in the USA, they're so sick and tired of what they're living in, they just don't know what, the, what life is. They don't know what love is. They don't know what life is because they hadn't experienced it. But they've experienced enough of the other that they're tired of it. We've got to be the laborers seeing them as white unto harvest because Jesus calls them white unto harvest. Yeah, I know. Okay, I'm going, I, I, I'm going, I'm going to cut real quick. I'll try Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That word in, 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 uh, in Romans 10, 17 is actually the word for word is rhema. It's a living and active word. It's the same living and active word he talks about in Hebrews 4, 12. Um, it's that spirit man who's in contact in that relationship to where the spirit starts giving you living and active word from your innermost being. Okay, we have the Word of God, the written Word of God. A lot of times that's used as logos or logos, depending on how you want to pronounce it. But it's a living and active word. It, and the rhema word is a living and active word. You can be driving down the street and he gives you a word. Now, it will not contradict Scripture, but it is a way he leads you from the inside out. Okay, Proverbs 18, 18 21. We, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. You know how a lot of times your faith grows? By you speaking it and hearing it. You speak it and you hear it. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Who's speaking it? Proverbs 18, 21 says you have the life and death in your tongue. What are you speaking? 2 Corinthians 4, 13 says speak. Speak things into existence. We believe, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 14, I believe, therefore I speak. Romans 4, 17 says, he spoke things into existence. Talking about Abraham. We speak things into existence. How? Because we're cooperating with God. God says, I called you to be my laborers, co-union with me, co-laborers with me, co-creators with me, and you speak it. And your faith grows as you speak. And if you find somebody downcast as a believer, if you find somebody walking around like this and all downcast and everything else, and they... 
they sound like Eeyore in the church, kick them out. No. Love on them and help them learn to speak God's word. Because God's word is truth and God's word is life and God's word is the way. And as you do that, they'll flourish. It's just they just got a negative mindset because they've been beat down by what they're speaking and what they're hearing. We got to quit buffeting the soul and quit buffeting the body and buffet the spirit. Oh, gosh. What else is on here? I got to do this one. Real quick. Enemies. Y'all, you guys okay? How many of you are bored? Uh, identity theft. Is this, this is the enemies of faith and believing. Identity theft, not knowing who you are. If you need to know who you are, we got, we got a little printout sheet back there, a real colorful printout sheet on that little table back there that tells you like 50 or 60 things of how God sees you. It's all scripture. You need to get that down deep in you so that you know who you are. Greatest theft in the world today and in the church today is identity theft. Not knowing who you are, but what the world tells you who you are. It's wrong. Okay, you need to know that. And uh, the second greatest theft going on is doubt in God's word doubt in God's word what was the first thing that the devil came to Adam and Eve with did God really say that what is the first thing that he came to Jesus with in the desert well if 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 you're the son of God. Jesus sat there and said, God, I don't know if I am or not. <clears throat> well, you know, you could be right. Why, why would you say if? Is that what he did? He repeated the word of God back to him. Why? Because the word of God is the only truth. It's the only life. Quit speaking death. Quit doubting the word of God. Doubt your doubts. Don't doubt him. Doubt your doubts, but don't doubt God. Too many people live in their feelings. They buffet that soul so much that the soul takes advantage of them and tells them, doubt your doubts, believe your doubts, don't believe the word. Doubt your doubts, believe God. The second biggest theft in the, in the church going on is doubting the word of God. Well, I just don't see it happening. Well, I, 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 know, I know that they were healed, but, but these people over here weren't healed. How many of you got pain in your body right now? Anybody? All right. He sent his word and healed them. By his stripes, you have been healed. I, am, I was healed 2,000 years ago. I am healed now. I am is healed, and I'm walking it out. Body, soul, you get in line with the spirit because the word is living and active, and it says, I am healed. Well, he doesn't look healed. I mean, he's still kind of walking. Yeah, you're right. I, I'm not really healed. I am healed. Well, why are you walking with him? I'm healed. I'm good. God's got me. Well, doubt. Doubt. Negativity. Full, it's fueled by anxiety, fear, negativity, reasoning in your mind, what if, how come, the victim mentality of this world. And leaves God completely out of the picture. Okay, B, same enemies the devil hit Jesus with. You can look at it, flesh, the world, and the devil. Turn the, turn the bread into fish, or turn the stone into, into bread. You're so powerful, jump off, he'll rescue you, pride. Just bow down and worship me. Okay, flesh the world and the devil. Psalm 1, not staying firmly planted by the river of life. If you do stay firmly planted, Psalm 1 is beautiful. You stay firmly planted, you'll never have withered leaves. You'll always be bountiful and fruitful. Go and be fruitful. Distractions become the main thing. Starts out subtle and then takes over. We end up being sheep of a different shepherd. Doubt, doubt, and more doubts. Feelings don't always line up with the word. So who are you going to go with? 
That's important. You wake up and don't feel good. That's important. And don't beat yourself up either if you have an attack come against you. There's no guilt and condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus, there therefore is now no guilt, no condemnation. If you wake up and an attack has hit you, you don't deny your feelings. What you do is you start attacking with the Word of God. It might take a month. You know, we're impatient. We want a Burger King moment. It might take a month, but you keep fighting. Because we're more than overcomers through him who loved us. We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. And his love never ends. It's unfailing. It's unfailing. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful what you hear, okay? What are you watching? What are you hearing? Where's your word coming from? Because I tell you, commercials are pumping it in you too. Mind transformation is soul transformation. But it's kept in place properly by the Spirit. Look at Galatians 5, Galatians 8. Flesh is always contrary to the Spirit. If you're not feeding the Spirit, you're going to get nothing but soul-led, flesh-led body. Okay? Feed the Spirit man, and the Spirit man will dominate the others and bring them into line so that you can experience the fullness of life, the fullness of joy, the fullness of peace, the fullness of His love, and you will be a bright and shining light in the midst of a crooked and perverted generation. That's what God wants for you. That's what God's got for you. And that's what He wants for the whole body. He wants light to overcome darkness. And we're the carriers of that glory. We're the carriers of that light. But are we feeding the spirit man to where the spirit man is rising up and being a mustard plant that's grown big, giving shade to all the people around us? Is that glory bubble going out and impacting that social distance bubble? All right, solution. I think this is it. Tasting makes you hungry. We've talked about that. Feasting becomes contagious. You feast on the Word of God. You prayer and fast and feast on the Word of God. You know it comes so contagious you can't, you can't help yourself. It's, what, it's where you taste and it makes you more hungry. Prayer and fasting don't make you holy. Prayer and fasting gets your spirit in the driver's seat where it belongs. Faith is only as strong as you're believing. Because the same measure of faith has been given to all. But not all believers are manifest, manifesting that same faith. You've been given it all. All that you need for life and godliness has been placed in you. Faith continues to grow and will dominate and reign if we continue exercising our believing. Hearing, listening, not distracted. Speaking is hearing, like I said. And then the giants of this world will be as small as Goliath. Do you know Goliath was very small in the face of David? David didn't say, well, man, look how big he is. Look at that armor. Man, I probably couldn't even pick his sword up. David said, I fought the lion. I fought the bear. Who's this uncircumcised Philistine? He has no covenant with God. I'm God's child. God will take care of it. And God gave him a response, didn't he? He relied on God. He spoke God. And God said, pick up five stones. David didn't say, five stones? What's that going to do? You see this guy gone? Five stones? How about a 50 cal submachine gun? How about a tank? A bazooka? A M203? Something? God says, pick up five stones. He picks up five stones. He didn't say, what's the other four for? God said, God was telling him, pick up five stones, be prepared. Finally be strong in the Lord because you know he's got four brothers coming. The lines, I love this. I love my sense of humor. So after I say this, you're going to say, did you say that? I think so. And the lions and tigers and bears of this world will be saying, oh my. As they see the light of his glory emanating from his army to where the army says the word. Remember the enemy, the cohort, the battalion that came after Jesus? John 18. You remember that? Ah, we're coming out with weapons. We're coming out with torches. We're showing our force. We're seeking Jesus, the Nazarene. I am. I am. What happened? They all fell backwards. What did he speak? The word. 
The same word that spoke creation into existence. The same word that lives in you. Whoever's doing communion, go ahead and pass it out. Oh, no, no, never mind, never mind. I got a special guest I want to come up right now. Jared, come on up. He's going to give his, he's going to give his testimony real quick. I'm sorry I ran past whatever. But he wants to tell you a word. Hello, um, I'm Jared. I don't know. Some of y'all know me. Some of y'all don't. I'm Pastor David's son. I don't know how to make it louder. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm Pastor David's son, and um, he wanted me to ser- share my testimony. So probably, I want to say it probably really just starts over when I was like 17, 18. Um, I was pretty much a drug addict um, for that whole entire time. And during that time, I was also suffering from um, suicidal depression, probably because of the drugs, but you know. Um, But the reason I'm up here is because um, it doesn't really matter how far you go. um, As long as you're willing to finally turn to God, he'll save you. Like, I mean, he saved me. Um, I ended up getting deliverance in San San Angelo with my brother um, probably about two months ago. And since then, it's been a roller coaster of different stuff. And um, basically, in summing that up, now I'm actually going to um, River Bible Institute in Tampa Bay, Florida to become a minister. So, yeah. That's pretty much it. <laughs> he, he, he could expound much more, but he's not. <laughs> but I'm telling you, in two months' time, stay up here. God's good. Amen. Praise God. Well, we... Uh, Jared is going to Bible school, right? Tuesday. Tuesday. Isn't that amazing how God can just turn a person's life around? October 16th till now. Let's give Jesus praise. Amen. He's the God of transformation. That's called grace. That's called saved by grace. Amen. The influence and the love of God. But, uh, and he was up, we were in Boston, is that where you Yes. And uh, they were up there, and sh- he shared his testimony up there, I guess. And someone. Um, oh, San Angelo, Texas. Yeah, that's Texas. where he was. Okay. Somebody. Anyway, yeah. someone in Texas, is yep. that right? Yep. Said that they would pay for three years of tuition for him. Okay. So God's good. Amen. But um, he's going to need, during this, we want to show our support prayer. We're going to pray for him in, in a second, but also. I want you to pray about supporting him, okay? Uh, he'll, he'll need s- money for housing and for uh, books and so forth. And this is a thing, okay? God has, uh, our new nature is a generous nature because it's the nature of God. And there is no fear of lack, amen? Fear of lack is not part of our nature. And so because we're free, okay in that respect then we're free to respond to the holy spirit however he speaks to our heart amen in that regards so what we want you to do is prayerfully ask the lord how you might want to support jared amen in this is that is that fair and if you decide to to um support him uh want to write a check just uh write it out to grace life fellowship but for jared Okay, anything you put, just put for Jerry. Put an envelope for Jerry. If it's money, or if you go online, okay, and do PayPal online, gracelifemb.com. We have a PayPal button there. Put there for Jared so we know how to direct that. Okay, did I miss anything? Okay, are we doing communion or what are we doing yeah, next? Let's pray. Okay, let's. And then we'll do let's communion. Let's do this. Those of you that feel led right now, I want you to come up and let's. We're going to pray for Jared. Okay, praise God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Praise.
Praise God. This is the church in action. This is what David yeah. was talking about right here. Are you with me? This is what David was talking about, about faith in action. Amen? Responding to the Holy Spirit and uh, the body of Christ coming around. And this is, this, is, this is one of many, 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 many to come. We said this, many prodigals are coming home. Amen? The harvest is coming in. And Jared represents a great increase of harvest in these last days. That is coming to Jesus, okay? The devil thought he had him, but guess what? Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. The influence of God is much greater, amen? So let's just pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just pray, pray. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for Jared right now. We thank you for the grace on Jared's heart and life. Thank you, Lord, that he responded to your love. Thank you, Lord, that he responded to that influence, that gift that you have given him in the faith that you put in his heart, Lord God. We know this is you, Lord. This, this is not a man. This is not by might or by power, but by your spirit, yes. Lord. Yes. Thank you, Lord, for the transformation in Jared's heart and life. God, we know that your hand is on him. We know all provision is there for him to go wherever you send him, Lord God, and to uh, equip him for others, Lord God. Hallelujah. I feel like he represents uh, the labors of the harvest, yes. the labors yes. that are coming yes. in of this great harvest. One billion, it was prophesied, one billion youth would be saved in the last days, okay? In an instant harvest that would come in and it's going to so shock the world. And it will be the increase in the beginning of a harvest that will never end. Will never end. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God, continue to surround him. Lord, fill him. Protect him. Continue to give him that hunger to, yes. to, to receive yes. your, your word, your living word. The abundance of grace, that gift of righteousness that will cause him to reign in life through Jesus Christ. So nothing that is not of you will reign over him, but he will reign over it, yes. Lord God. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name. Thank Hallelujah. you, Lord. Thank Hallelujah. you, Lord. Establish him in, in his new identity in you, Lord God. In the grace of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for those divine appointments, divine encounters. Uh, d divine uh, connections, I see, Lord God, that you are already uh, preparing those divine, <laughs> hallelujah, those d divine uh, ca uh, relationship connections, Lord God, that will build him up in the way that he needs to be built up, Lord God, in every way. Lord, thank you, Lord Jesus. Help him to have, God, an ear to hear your voice to respond to you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You spread a table before him in the presence of his enemies, Lord God, and are calling him to dine. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory. Everyone said amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Yeah. 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 Also, if you, if you, if the Lord uh, has you, uh, if, um, quickens you, Dan reminded me of a, there'll be ongoing monthly expenses. If the Lord quickens you to donate a certain like amount to Jared, okay, per month to help him, then you can do that too. Just make sure that you, you designate that on your, amen. So, are we doing communion? <laughs> okay. We're also having lunch because we always have leftovers. <laughs> I mean, you know, God is the God of leftovers. <laughs> he really is. When it, anytime Jesus fed the multitudes, there was leftovers. There was 12 baskets, there were 7 baskets. He's he's not a God that just barely 
you know, gives us what we need. It's always in abundance and plenty. Amen? And so, anyway, we have, we have some awesome food that we'll be partaking of, and we invite everyone. It doesn't matter if you brought something or not, okay? I mean, you know, a lot of this, it's about time together and fellowship and love. Amen? That's what we're created for, fellowship and love huddles. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you for that word, David. Amen. Let's thank God for the word that brought. And uh, actually, there was a whole bunch of elements all through that that the Lord had been speaking to my heart as well. Uh, so I know that, you know, the Holy Spirit is speaking. Amen. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. And one of, the, one of those things is the, um, let me turn this off here. One of those things was the uh, feeding. Where are you feeding? What are you feeding on? Amen? It really does make a difference, okay, what you're feeding on as far as what's going to manifest in your life. And so the scripture that came to me, too, was Isaiah. Is it Isaiah f- um, 40? Is it Isaiah 40? I get those. Those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, okay? How many of you w- want to walk in supernatural strength? Okay, it's supernatural strength. How many know you can walk in supernatural strength of the Lord? But you have to feed on the Word. Those that wait on the Lord, which means that you feed on the Word. You feed feed on the thoughts of the Lord. Those that wait, it doesn't mean wait around waiting for God to do something. That's that Americanized thing again. Okay, bring me a burger, God. No, (laughs) no. No, it means to feed, to be intentional, right? To be intentional. We're not talking legalism. Sometimes we, uh, under grace, we think everything's legalistic. <laughs> we we got to be careful with that, amen? But there are some things that, that we need to know that, hey, it's about relationship. But I, how many of you know I intentionally spend time with my wife, amen? We intentionally spend t- time, you know, with those that we love, amen? And it helps to build us, build that relationship up, right? So he says, those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, which means exchange your strength, your natural strength, for his supernatural strength. And then you shall run and not be weary, and you shall walk and not faint. And this is a timely word because we are going to need strength for the journey. I'm telling you. We have, we have the treasure in this earthen vessel. We have. I mean, God's already spread a table before us. We have everything we need. We're complete in Christ. But we have to continue to, to feed on what the Lord gives us, listen to the Lord, respond to him. And, you know, when they left Egypt, okay, they, they fed, they ate the lamb, every bit of that lamb. They put blood This is a good segue into this. They put blood on the doorpost, right, of the house. That was their protection. And he said, eat the lamb, every bit of it. You know what that was for? Strength for their journey. Strength for their journey. Supernatural strength for their journey. And I believe, I really believe with all my heart that the one of the main reasons the Lord instituted this was to give us supernatural strength. Amen? Supernatural strength. This is not just some ceremonial thing. This is something that the Lord says, do this often, and as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Amen? Again, remembrance, renewing our minds to what Christ has already accomplished for us, and to what Christ is now doing in us, okay? We are not just mere mortal human beings. We are supernatural, spiritual beings. We're living beings, amen? We're not living doings. We're living beings, amen? And so, Lord, we thank you for your body that was broken for us, Lord God, by your stripes, we were healed. We receive all that you bought and paid 
and shed your blood and your body was broken for. We receive all the benefits. We forget not all your benefits. Who has forgiven all our sins and who has healed all our diseases. All our diseases. No plague comes near our dwelling. Lord, we thank you. We are, our faith is in your word. It doesn't matter what we've gone through or what we've experienced. Your word is true. Amen? Your word is true, Lord God. We keep coming back to your word, and we confess what you say is true. And we do this in remembrance of you. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your blood that was shed for us. We are righteous. We are redeemed. We are planted in you, baptized in you, in union with you. Because you're righteous, we are righteous. Because you are holy, we are holy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We have no shame, no guilt. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ, Lord, because of your blood. We honor you. We honor your sacrifice, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, that we are the redeemed, and we do this in remembrance of you. Amen. Amen. Let's give Jesus praise. Yeah. Yep. Amen. Um, it's just really, it's really on, on my heart, Jared, to tell you that. Um, It's just on my heart to tell you that this is not obviously not a coincidence about how fast all this is happening and that the Lord wants you to know, even though you're, you're young, that um, he will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. And it's not just for you, it's for your relationship with your parents too. He loves you. Amen. Let's give Jesus praise. And, and you do what, like all of us did, okay? And that's this. Forget those things that are behind. Amen? And live in the presence. You're a new creation in Christ. Rip off the rearview mirror. And just, amen? Thank you, Jesus. Sure. Go ahead. <laughs> 